Today we want to look at Matthew chapter 26 and the subject of the weakest link. In the 17th century in England, there was a famous Puritan leader, and he was the only man to ever remove a king and rule over England, not as a king, but as a really a governor. It was a man called Oliver Cromwell. And Oliver Cromwell was a godly man, and he led the nation of England through much difficulty and turmoil and established uh, the Christian faith in that nation in the 17th century. One day, someone asked Oliver Cromwell, because there was no photographs in those days, to sit for a portrait painting. And he said, okay. And Oliver Cromwell sat for a period of time as the painter would paint him. And then, like you and I, he got impatient. And he said to the painter, let me see what you've done. So they turned around the painting and they looked at it. And Oliver Cromwell said, you have left out something. There are two warts on my face that you have ignored. Of course, the painter, being afraid of the great general Oliver Cromwell, had decided to remove the blemishes. He was kind of a pre-photoshopper before photoshopping. Cromwell looked at him and he said to the painter, No, you paint me warts and all, all my blemishes. And you know, that's what the Bible does when it paints the portrait of the lives of our fellow believers. The Bible doesn't ignore their blemishes, it doesn't cover up their blemishes or their failures, but it paints them warts and all. You see who they are, their strengths and their weaknesses. Now, God does that not to discourage us, but to encourage us, that these men and women that we read of in the Bible uh, that are regarded as heroes of the faith, they are flesh and blood. They are just like you and I. Sometimes when you travel around Europe, you go to these grand cathedrals and church buildings, and there are pictures of the 12 apostles, aren't there, on the stained glass windows. And when you look at them, they're always portrayed in very saintly ways. That's why they're called St. Peter or St. Paul or St. Mark. And as you look at them closely, often there's this halo around their head, and they look very spiritual. Almost perfect. Well, that's not how the Bible pictures men like Peter, men like John Mark, men like the Apostle Paul. It shows them in all of their strength, but also their weakness. Now, in this incident in Matthew 26 that we read is one where the Bible reveals the failure of a man called Peter. Now, Peter is a very interesting individual. He dominates the early part of the New Testament. The book of Acts is predominantly, the first section is all about Peter's ministry and how God used him. And Peter is a very interesting individual. His full name is Simon bar Jonah. That's how he's introduced. Simon was his real name, his Jewish name. Bar means son of. And Jonah is a Hebrew word for John or Jonah. It's the same idea of the same word, just different ways of spelling it. And Peter's father, or Simon Peter's father, was called Jonah or John. So he was called Simon, the son of John or Jonah, Simon bar Jonah. But somewhere along the line, the Lord Jesus Christ gave him another name, a second name, a kind of a nickname. I understand from many of the Filipinos, after being with them for a number of years, that they like to give nicknames. And they always say, we're so-and-so. And And I say, well, who's so-and-so? That's not the name I have. And they say, no, no, that's their nickname, their pet name. Well, that's kind of what Jesus did. He called him Petros or Peter, meaning a small rock. So his name was changed from just Simon, the son of Jonah, Simon bar Jonah, to Simon Peter. 
Now, maybe Jesus gave him this nickname, a little rock or a little stone, in order to strengthen his resolve, because Peter was a person who often wavered in his faith. He was not a, a perfect person. He was a person who was easily swayed to extremes of devotion and courage and boldness, but also failures and hot-headedness. Now, the background to this incident of the failure of Peter, or another failure of Peter's, is in Matthew 26, as Jesus is on his way to the cross. In just a few hours from this incident, Jesus Christ will be on the cross. He will be dying for the sins of mankind. And in verse 31, after they had sung a hymn on the Mount of Olives, Jesus says to his disciples, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. Now, he's very inclusive. He's very certain. It's not maybe offended. He says, all of you that are listening to me, Peter, James, John, all of them that are in that group, all of you will be offended, will be afraid because of me, will deny me, will want to have nothing to do with me. Because Jesus knew something, that just a few more hours, the cross was coming. Just a few more hours, the soldiers would arrive and they would all run away and leave him and flee from him. Peter would, James would, John would, Nathaniel would, all of them. So he tells them straight, all of you will run away. All of you will effectively deny me. And he even quotes an Old Testament prophecy from the book of Zechariah, chapter 13. For it is written, written where? Zechariah 13. I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. Jesus says, what's going to happen in the early hours of this morning? Because they're on the Mount of Olives already, waiting for the soldiers to arrive to arrest him and take him to the trial. He says... All of you this night will fulfill the prophecy of Zechariah 13 that the shepherd, that's me, will be smitten. And all of you will run away. The sheep will be scattered. Now, Jesus didn't single Peter out and say, Peter, I have my eye on you. You're the one that's really going to let me down. You're like Judas. No, he just said all of you, all inclusive. And what happens? Jesus is revealing the plan of God. Why does Jesus know the plan of God? Because Jesus is God. Even Peter acknowledged that himself in Matthew 16. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. You, you're the Messiah. You're the one who knows the future. You're fully God, fully man. You're the promised seed of Eve that will bruise the head of the serpent. You're the promised seed of David who will come from David's royal family and sit on David's throne. So Peter knew all of that. He knew that Jesus was the Messiah. He knew that Jesus was fully God and fully man. He knew that Jesus knew the future because Jesus controlled the future. But yet, notice what he does in verse 33. Peter answered, and said unto him. Now, just pause for a second. The Lord Jesus Christ had just revealed something very sober. He just had explained from Scripture and from his own infallible knowledge of the future that he was going to be smitten, that he was going to the cross in just a few hours. He was going to die. And in verse 32 as well, he tells them, I will rise again. The cross, the tomb, the resurrection is all part of God's plan and it's all going to happen. And I'm doing this because of your sin, Peter. Because you're a sinner. James, you're a sinner. John, you're a sinner. And you need a savior. I'm going because 
God needs a substitute to take the punishment for sin. Now, this is a very sober, solemn revelation, a very sacred, holy moment. And yet Peter, at that most holy, sacred moment, decides to speak up. And he says in verse 33, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never, never, it couldn't, not possible, he says, be offended. Peter talked when he should have been listening. Jesus never asked for his opinion. Jesus was just giving a revelation. And Peter decided he knew better. He decided he would correct him and give a more accurate representation of the future. And you notice how dismissive he is of all the rest. Though all forsake you, all be offended, all run away. He says, you know, look at James and Judas and John and uh, look at Andrew, Bartholomew. They're weak. They're cowardly. But what, he, what he's saying is, I'm superior to them. I'm greater than them. I'm better than them. I'm spiritually above them. And no doubt, Peter, because he was one of the inner three, Peter, James, and John, and he was one of the first to be chosen as a disciple. He was there at the very beginning. This really inflated his pride, and he thought he was special. He thought he was better than all the rest. And he wanted everybody to see that, to know it. Reminds me of the story of the little African man who decided to go to church in Africa. And after being in church for a few weeks, he went to the shoe shop and he said, I want a beautiful pair of shoes to wear to church. So the man made him a pair of shoes, the cobbler, the shoemaker. He went to church and then he came back the next day and he said, I need you to change those shoes. And the shoemaker said, why? What's wrong with them? Do they not fit properly? Are they uncomfortable? Oh, he says, no, 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 no. They fit comfortably. And they fit very well. But the problem is, he said, when I walk up and down the church, they don't make any sound. And I've observed that some of the people, when their shoes have a little squeak as they walk up and down the aisle. And he said, I'd like to have a squeak in my shoes. We laugh because we know of the folly of human pride. Just want to be seen. Isn't that right? So childish. And there are a lot of Christians like that. They come to even God's house, to the sacred place of worship, in order to be seen. In order to let people know how special they are. There was an old preacher many years ago went to visit an old farmer in his congregation. And he said to the man in his congregation, he said to him, Sir, what is the greatest hindrance to spiritual growth? The old man, the old farmer said to the preacher, what do you think? The preacher said, well, I think surely... It is to renounce our sinful self. That's that's the the greatest way to spiritually grow, to renounce all sin from our lives. No, said the old farmer. We don't need to simply renounce our sinful self. The greatest hindrance is to renounce our righteous self, our self-righteous self. That's the greatest hindrance in worship. And here at this solemn moment, Peter was so puffed up with spiritual pride over all the rest that he wanted everybody to know, I'm special. I'm different. And he said this publicly to the Lord Jesus Christ and to all the rest. But then notice something else. Peter not only dismissed all the rest as spiritually inferior, but even worse, he dared to not only disagree, 
with Scripture that was quoted by the Lord Jesus Christ, he dared to contradict the Lord Jesus Christ himself to his face. Because Jesus says, all of you will be offended. Peter says, I won't. You're wrong. Jesus says, Zechariah says in his scripture that this is a fulfillment of this prophecy. All the sheep will be scattered. Peter says, not me. Zechariah's wrong. There's one who won't be scattered. There's one who won't be offended. It's me. The more spiritual one. The better one. Peter did something else. He trusted in his own strength. Do you notice how he says this? In verse 33. Yet will I, it's all about me, my power, never be offended. He says, I'm too strong. I'm too great to ever feel like this, to ever falter like this. Oh, Peter was full of self-confidence, wasn't he? So much so that the pride welled in him that he dared to contradict the Old Testament Scripture and the Lord Jesus Christ to his face in front of all the other disciples. You know, here's the irony in the story. Peter didn't even know how weak he was. He thought he was strong. And in just a few hours of uttering these words, he would deny the Lord Jesus Christ not once, not twice, but three times in public. The same man who boasted in this situation at this moment in just a few hours would fall flat on his face. Now here's something very interesting. There's probably something you never knew before. Certainly I never noticed this before until last night I was reading this. If you go to John's Gospel chapter 13. John's Gospel chapter 13. And the context of John 13 is Jesus is in the upper room. You can read the story all the way through these chapters. Now, when did the upper room Passover happen? Before they went to the Mount of Olives. Before the incident in Matthew 26 that we just read. And verse 31. So in the upper room, before they went to the Mount of Olives, the Lord Jesus said something to Peter. In John 13, verse 36. Simon Peter said unto him, this is at the first Lord's Supper, the upper room, the Passover feast. So this is before the incident of Matthew 26 in the garden on the Mount of Olives. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answers to him, whether I go, thou canst not follow, thou canst not follow me, but thou shalt follow me afterward. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. So Jesus warned Peter an hour or two before this incident in Matthew 26, in the upper room, Before the cock crows tomorrow morning, you will have denied me three times. And Peter never listened. Peter refused to hear. Peter thought he knew better. So when he denies that he will be offended by Jesus Christ in Matthew 26 and verse 33, this is the second time in the evening that he does it. The second time he's been warned by Jesus Christ that he will deny Christ three times. And yet both times, Peter refuses to listen. Now here's the interesting thing about Peter. If you were to ask Peter at this moment in time, Peter, what are your strengths? and What are your weaknesses? I'm sure Peter would say, well, I I have some weaknesses. I'm not perfect. I lose my temper. I tend to be jealous of the other disciples. I tend to squabble. I'm outspoken sometimes. Those are the deficiencies in my character. But my strengths are this. I'm very loyal. I'm very courageous. I'm one who is not afraid 
to say, I belong to Jesus Christ. And Peter, if you were to ask him, what are your strengths? He would have said, my strengths are my boldness, my outspokenness, my fearlessness. But here's the interesting thing. The things that Peter thought he was strong in proved to be his weakest. And the devil snared him at his weakest point. Now, why does that so often happen? Because the areas that we think we are strong, we don't defend. Isn't that right? The areas that we think that we can handle ourselves, we tend to not seek God's help. We tend to be self-confident. We tend to trust too much in our own wisdom, our own strength. And we say, I can handle that bit. Those are easy for me, but I need God's help in this area. And the devil knows that we drop our guard in certain areas of our lives. Maybe I'm talking to someone like this today. Maybe you say, well, I'm, I'm good at managing my house, so I don't need God's help for that. I'm good at running the business. I'm good at managing my children. I don't need God's help for that bit. But there's other areas of my life, yeah, yeah, I can admit. I lose my temper too easily, or uh, I tend to be jealous. I, I, I tend to uh, fall in this area. And uh, those areas, I admit, I'm weak and I need God's help. Well, let me tell you. The area that the devil's targeting you right now is the area you think you're strong because that's where you're most vulnerable. Earlier today, we looked at the life of Elijah as he came from Jezreel to Mount Horeb. And of all the people in the Bible to be afraid of a woman, you'd never would have imagined it would be Elijah. Isn't that right? Of all the strengths and weaknesses of Elijah's character, the one thing you would put him down for is fearlessness. He's not easily intimidated. But yet we discover that the area that Elijah thought he was strong, and you and I thought he was strong, turned out to be his weakest link. And down he fell. And the same for Peter here. The area that we would have thought Peter was so strong, that Peter thought he was so strong, was the area that the devil knew he was particularly weak and vulnerable. And you'll discover the same is true for yourself. If you ever find yourself thinking in your mind, I am a strong Christian, I am a mature Christian, then there should be a blue flashing light in your heart saying, watch out, you're about to fall. If you ever find yourself looking around, maybe in your family, maybe in the restaurant even, maybe in the church, and you look to your left and you look to your right and you say, I'm stronger than her. I'm stronger than him. I'm a better Christian than him and her. Then watch out. You're already on your way down. You're already hitting about to hit the buffers like Peter here. And the devil is a master deceiver at deceiving us to think we are strong when we're so weak and so vulnerable. And no greater example than in this passage of Peter, the proud peacock, boasting in his courage, his determination, and his abilities. I will never be offended by you. You notice how certain he is. There's not even a question in Peter's mind. It's not even 99.9% .9 certain. He's 100% certain. All will be run away, but not me. What does Jesus say to him? Verse 34. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee. Now, anytime you see that word verily, I've explained to you before, it's an old English word that means it's absolutely, pay attention to what I'm about to say. It's really what it says. Truly, this is certain. This is guaranteed. Truly, or verily, I say unto you, this night, not, not in a week's time, Jesus says, not in a month's time, this very night, just a few hours from now, Peter, not even 24 hours, not even 12 hours, Peter, this night, before the dawn arises, he says, this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me three times, not once, 
but three times. Now, if we could have said in verse 31 that the warning there from Zechariah 13 is a general one, and Peter said, well, Jesus is just talking in general to all the disciples. It doesn't apply to me. There's always an exception. There's no question here now in verse 34 that Jesus is talking only to Peter. It's only to you. This is a personal prophecy to you, Peter. Nobody else in the room. Jesus says, I say unto thee, you, Peter. Now, it's something he said a few hours before in the upper room, but I'm saying it again. Before the night end and the dawn rise with the crowing of the cock to indicate a new day has begun in Israel. You will deny me three times. Three times. Now, you can't get it any clearer than that. Peter doesn't need a PhD to understand what Jesus is saying here, does he? He doesn't need a dictionary. It's absolutely crystal clear. But even when he receives this personal Specific warning. What is Peter's reaction? Verse 35. Peter said unto him, instead of pausing, instead of hesitating to reflect on his past failures, and reflect on how Jesus Christ fully is God and fully man and knows the future and has never made a mistake in any of his pronouncements, instead of reflecting on any of those things, Peter's in for a penny, in for a pound, and he jumps further. And he says to the Lord Jesus Christ the second time to argue with him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. He's absolutely certain again. His confidence is not dented in any way by Jesus Christ quoting the scripture and giving him a specific prophecy. Peter says, no, it's impossible. Impossible for me to fall. Do you not know who I am? Saint Peter? You don't know who I'm going to be in the future. I'm going to be the leading disciple. I was with you from the beginning. That James guy, John, Andrew, they're weak. But not me. I'm strong. I've got great faith. And here is a man that has spiritually lost the run of himself, hasn't he? He has the wrong perspective. Now, it's not as if Peter has not been wrong before. In arguing with Jesus Christ. If you were to read Luke's gospel chapter 5. You would read how he was wrong about the nets. Jesus says put down the nets. Peter says no, 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 no. You're wrong. I know fishing. You don't know fishing. We've toiled all night and brought in nothing. Jesus says never mind. Peter throw out the nets. And just to please Jesus. Peter threw out a net. Singular. Not the nets. Just one. And we discover in the story that the net broke because of the great number of fish that was in the water. Jesus knew better. We remember the story in Matthew 14, how Peter asked to walk on the water. And as he walked on the water, Jesus says, come out and walk on the water. His eyes went off the Savior and started to look at the water and down he sunk. We remember the incident in Matthew 16 where He dared to rebuke the Lord Jesus Christ when he revealed that he was going to the cross and Christ said to him, get thee behind me, Satan. So it's not as if Peter hadn't got it wrong before, hadn't made mistakes before. It's not as if Jesus Christ had made wrong pronouncements before. For three and a half years, Peter had a front row seat witnessing the miracles Witnessing the sermons, witnessing the answers Christ gave to the most difficult questions. But despite all of these lessons, Peter didn't learn the truth about Peter. Now, let me wrap this up. Before you look down your nose at Peter this afternoon as it is now, and say, how could he do that? How could he talk like that? How could he argue with Jesus like that? How could he think he's superior? How could he think he's so strong? You know how you find the answer to that? After this service is over, you make your way to the toilets across the way. 
and there's big mirrors there. And you just look in the mirror, and you'll get your answer. Because you're just like Peter. So quickly we are to forget how weak we really are. So self-confident we are. Most of us got up this morning, I'm sure, most of us never give a thought that God had protected us throughout the night. Never thought about it. Most of us never walked to church or drove to church today and said, thank you, Lord, for your protection upon me. We're breathing oxygen in right now and none of us are acknowledging God for it. We just assume. And we're assuming all of us that tomorrow will come and there'll be another day and there'll be money in the pocket and there'll be food on the table. And we assume that 2021 will be better than 2020 for us. And we've got all our plans and our dreams. And we're full of self-confidence. Just like Peter. And even though when the Bible says, put not thy trust in any man, well, we just do that ourselves. Even though the Bible says, your breath is in the hand of God. Life is like a vapor which appears for a little while and vanishes away. We still don't really believe it. We acknowledge it intellectually. But in our life, we don't believe it. We just get on with living life. So confident. So proud. So self-reliant. We've even now got little phones, haven't we? That tell you how much money you have in the bank. You don't even have to. In the old days, you, have to, you used to have to go down to UOB, didn't you? And say, could you tell me how much I have? And you see some of the old folks with those little books. Do you see them? The little card books. Now, you just press the button. So many thousands. Some in this room, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. And then we've got little apps that tell us, you've got insurance to cover this, and this, and this. Travel insurance, health insurance, life insurance. We've even got apps that tell us what properties we own. And with all these things, we can become very self-confident, just like Peter. I think, I can handle life. I can handle tomorrow. I need the Jesus bit for the end of the journey, you know, to get to heaven. I need him for, to take me from earth to heaven, I, I need him there, but this bit from now till I get there, I can handle that myself. I won't be offended. Maybe some of you are here saying, I've been a Christian for many years, and I know the Bible, and I can quote passage after passage, and I've read all these theology books, and all these Bible commentaries, and I know I'm strong. Maybe you walk around Suntech City, and you look at some of the other churches and the other Christians, and you think to yourself, hmm, I'm glad I'm not like them. Well, that's, that's the spirit of Peter. And it's in you. It's in you. And it can easily flare up at any moment in time. And the Lord had to teach Peter a bitter lesson. And we'll discover in a few chapters just how bitter it is. And Peter is going to have to fall in order to find out how weak he really is. And he's going to have to fall very far. It's going to be a very painful lesson. But let me finish by saying this. Just turn with me to one verse. 1 Peter chapter 5. After many years, when Peter was an old man, about to die, more than 30 years or so after this incident in Matthew 26, he wrote 1st and 2nd Peter. And in 1st Peter chapter 5, he said this to his fellow Christians. And he's saying this from as much personal experience as his own theological understanding. And in 1st Peter chapter 5, verse 8, he says this, Be sober. In other words... Don't get carried away with yourself. Life is a serious thing. Just be careful. Be sober. Be vigilant. Watch out. Keep your eyes open. 
Why? Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. This word devour means gulp down. He says Satan is like the lion going around, prowling from place to place. And the lion hides for its prey and waits until its prey is very vulnerable in the wrong place at the wrong time for the prey. And then you see the lion racing out from the hidden, from the shadow and attacking the prey and gulping it down, tearing it apart. And he says, that's the way the devil is. He's always on the prowl. He's always watching. Waiting for your vulnerable moment. Waiting to see when you're self-confident and you're not paying attention. You're not looking for help from God. You're looking to man for help. And he says, the moment you feel like that and think like that, beware the devil is coming for you. To get you. And then he finishes 1 Peter 5 by saying this. Verse 9. Whom resist steadfast in the faith. Knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After that ye have suffered a while. Make you perfect, establish, strengthen. Do you see that? Peter says, ah, learn this lesson the hard way. You need God's strength. Not Peter's strength. Not your strength. You need Every day to get up and say, God, I need your help to get through today. Need your help just to get through the breakfast without losing my temper, without losing my testimony, without saying the wrong thing to the wrong person in the wrong way, without acting in the wrong way. I'm weak, I'm vulnerable, and Satan is strong, but I know God is stronger, and I need you. And maybe that's where you're going wrong in your life. That you're too self-confident. And you're not God-confident. And I say this to you as we close. If you don't think like the old Peter, sorry, you think like the older Peter, that you need God's help. If you don't start to think that way, you're going to fall. You're going to fall badly. Aren't you glad Peter got up again? Aren't you glad God didn't give up on him? Aren't you glad that Peter learned his lessons? Some Christians never do. Hudson Taylor, the founder of the China Inland Mission, was speaking in a Western country. Many years after he had founded the China Inland Mission, they had almost a thousand missionaries. And an old, two old ladies met him after he had spoken in their church. And they were very unimpressed because they'd heard a lot about this famous missionary, Dr. Hudson Taylor. And they said, well, this guy, he's pretty small and he's, his voice is not very powerful. And they met Hudson Taylor's wife and they said to her, how is it that God could use such a man like this? of such insignificance to lead this great work in China. Hudson Taylor's wife was telling him what the old ladies had said about him. And unlike us, he was not offended in the least. Hudson Taylor came over to talk to the ladies. He says, I'm not offended by your question in the least. In fact, it's exactly an accurate and a fair question. And he says, I want to give you the answer. The reason God was able to take a weak, insignificant person like me and use someone like me to do all of these things is because God looked all around the world for someone weak enough and knew that he was weak enough for God to use. And he found me. Because he knew that if he could use a man like me, God would get all the glory in what he did. 
That's the answer to your question. And you know, God doesn't use strong people. He only uses weak people. You can be too big for God to use, but you can never be too small for God to use if you're willing to come and admit you're weak and he is strong. John Bunyan grew up in England in the 17th century. His father worked was a metal worker. John Bunyan became what we would call in Singapore a garanguli man. You know, the one that goes around buying bits and pieces from people's houses and selling them on. The English called it a peddler or a tinker. John Bunyan, the tinker, the garanguli man, went around the villages and towns where he lived, buying things and selling things. Until one day God saved him, changed him, called him to be a preacher of a small church in Bedford. And through that ministry, he ended up in jail because of the king's desire to shut down preachers like him. After he came out of jail, and he had written that famous book, The Pilgrim's Progress. He was invited to London to speak at prominent churches. And people wanted to hear the, the man who wrote the famous Pilgrim's Progress, the second greatest work in literature in the English language. The Garanguli guy who became the great writer and preacher. And when he went to London, which was considered the center of culture and learning at that time, to preach, the chancellor of Oxford University was a man called Dr. John Owen, famous theologian in his own right, philosopher. And he would come along and sit in the congregation and listen to John Bunyan preach. And after he had heard Bunyan, he would go to visit the king because he was the king's chancellor. And King Charles said to him, Dr. Owen, why do you waste your time, a man of your education, a man of your learning and power and prestige, why do you waste your time going down to hear that old tinker preach? You with all your qualifications. And Dr. John Owen, looked at the king and he shook his head and he said this, Your Majesty, if I could speak with a fraction of the power and the, power, the anointing of God that that old tinker has, I would give up all my education and titles and honors and achievements. You see, John Owen understood the secret to John Bunyan wasn't John Bunyan. It was John Bunyan's God. And if you have God's power and God's presence in your life, it doesn't matter what your background is. God can take you. And God can use you. And Peter had to learn that lesson. But thank God he learned it. In the end. You too must learn it today. Let us pray. Father, we thank thee for this story of Peter and even his failures that remind us that we are not strong. Only God is strong. There are no strong Christians. There's just a strong God. Help us as we come around the table of the Lord. A vivid reminder of the debt that we owe Christ. The weakness of human flesh in that we can't even deal with one single sin by our own strength, by our own wisdom. Bless us now as we meet around the table. Speak to each and every one. For we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.